I just want to thank everybody for joining us for today's session, a technical overview of Governland. Uh, just a quick a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are taking Q&A. Uh, Victor Cruz will be handling that. He's one of our support leads. Um, and I'll be walking through a demo of Governland, really cover some of the basics, how you set up Governland. You'll see some of that on my screen right now. Then uh, dive into managing the Governland agents, and then some of the more advanced features, automation, some cool reporting, and some other stuff. Uh, welcome you to participate again. Q&A is open. You can chat with us, ask any questions. We'll address as many as we can. I'll start off by uh, just giving a brief intro to Governland and what's required uh, to get to get going with uh, Governland. Um, you, uh, really, all you need is a single Windows desktop. From there, you can see on my screen that your first step will be to push out a couple of agents once you stand up the console, and we're going to use uh, port 445 for that. It's a silent installation. You don't have to pre-configure the machines aside from making sure port, port 445 is open. After the agents are installed, all communication uses a single firewall port. It can be configured by you, but the default port is 21158. Now, for those of you who are evaluating Goverland, you'll see something called the Goverland Central Server. Uh, it's not required to evaluate Goverland, and it's really what you see down there is it's a policy setting app, so a, a policy distribution application. So. Uh, when you communicate with remote machines and you want to display different notifications to the end user or you want the end user to have to accept a remote control session, you would use the Goverland Central Server for that. But if you're just uh, evaluating, you can stand up just the console, deploy some agents, and get a good feel for what you have going on within uh, Goverland. And I'm going to show you the Goverland Agent Manager, which is located in the help here. And this is the best way to go and manage your agents, uh, especially if you're managing, obviously, multiple agents, a lot of agents at once. And all you do is hit this little plus sign. Uh, you can add single computers, domain computers, or just scan computers by IP scan. I'm going to navigate over into uh, some production workstations here and just grab a couple of workstations and just take a look at uh, the agent status and uh, get a feel for what's going on. <clears throat> and you can see right away, as soon as I add these machines, I can see that all the agents are up to date. From here, I can highlight a few agents, and I can update these agents. I can also remove the agents. It's all totally transparent to the end user, no restart required on their end or anything like that. And you can see the agents quickly become uninstalled, and I can just as easily add them back in. Uh, process is that quickly, so uh, really, really simple to add and remove agents, everything from within the console. Now, coming back to the console here, uh, we're going to try and take this in a different direction than what we've been doing over the uh, past couple of weeks. And I want to walk you through Goverland objects first. Um, and so from the welcome page here, you'll see this link to manage Goverland objects. And there are a couple of different objects that we can build out. And these objects are what we use to build out automation and simplify our job later on. And so the, the first one here is software packages. And uh, we've been getting a lot of questions on software packages, especially lately. And so we're trying to do a little bit more tutorials and, and helpful information on how to deploy software. And so I'm actually going to go and build out a software package for deployment right now. And uh, all you need to do is hit this little plus sign, and you can choose between an MSI or, or an EXE file. Uh, we're going to deploy an MSI file, and I can give it a quick name. I can say, you know, this is Adobe Reader version 11. I can put in an optional description. If I want to leave a note for uh, other folks on the team, like, hey, this is great for deploying on Windows 10 machines or Windows 7 machines or anything like that, you can put some additional information in there. And you can also put it in a category or a folder. So if I have all my Adobe patches, I can store them all in one place. Now, here's the uh, kind of trickiest part is I have to point Goverland to where that package is located. And so I just put it on a file share or something like that. It just has to be somewhere that's accessible to the console. And that's really the trickiest part. So uh, we're pretty much done here. Now, the only thing that you might have to do for executables is to find some argument strings for unattended or silent installation. And here you have to do a bit of research for uh, on some of these executables just to make sure you get the right 
argument strings. And a great first step is to uh, deploy it on a test machine. I actually built this out already. I, all I did was uh, yeah, actually Victor uh, did some research on Adobe Reader 11 silent install, came up with the argument strings, popped them in there, and now we, we have this ready for deployment on remote machines. And we're going to go and actually deploy this on a machine or two in just a moment. Uh, some of the other things you can store in Goverland objects are script packages. And uh, the really cool thing about the way Goverland does scripts is that um, it, you can organize them in folders, you can share them among team members, and then on top of that, um, you, it's the way we deploy a script. So we're actually going to take that script, transfer it to the client, uh, using our, our encrypted communication, and then run it, and then transfer those results back to you. So you don't have to have be concerned with opening up additional ports to enable remote PowerShell support, for example. You build your scripts out within Goverland, and they'll be available to you with a single click. And we'll take a look at that as well. External controls lets me hang other applications off of Goverland. Here I have some pretty straightforward examples, a couple of console apps. If I want to open up an event viewer on a remote machine, I'll just show you what it looks like. It's really straightforward to build out and a really helpful tool. I mean, you give it a name and a description, and then you're just calling the uh, console lab for event viewer. Uh, custom actions, we can sequence complex events. And so if I have an install that I need to do, for example, that is part of this install, I also have to do a registry update. Maybe I want to set, set it to not update automatically. So I want to apply a registry update as part of the install. And then the install requires a restart. As opposed to visiting each machine and performing an action, I can build it out here in the wizard and then deploy it with a single click. And any of these actions you can set to fire off in a different order just by, uh, by dragging and dropping. And just to show you some other examples of things you may have in custom actions, things like changing a Wi-Fi password or uninstalling applications, or uh, we're going to go through some user management examples of provisioning a user or terminating a user. So you, you know, if you're doing a lot of uh, Active Directory work and finding yourself clicking through Active Directory users and computers quite a bit because your company is onboarding a lot of users, you can, uh, you can build out templates for what these users look like and then just all you do is create the object, double click on this, and it's going to provision the user for you according to how you build this out. So uh, and we'll, we'll run through a bunch of examples of uh, everything uh, we just took a look at here in uh, Custom Actions. And so with that, we're going to dive in. We're going to take a look at uh, administration and diagnostics first. This is great for all your behind the scenes management. Um, so it uh, all starts with this Active Directory search here. And uh, you can see that uh, if you click on this how search works, you can see it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive AD search. I can search based on any of those different attributes. I can use um, Active Directory queries and wildcards and things like that. So if I just search for department is equal to IT, it'll come up with all my IT users. I can do a partial machine name. I can even do wildcards at the beginning and at the end. So if I know I have a vPro machine sitting out there, for example, it'll find that match for me. But even better, um, you know, we support users, not their machines. So we're going to search for a user here, set focus on them, and it's going to uh, navigate through Active Directory and drop us into the OU that contains that user. Now, from here, we can access this user's account. Um, so I can, uh, this is kind of the best parts of Active Directory management brought to the forefront. I can quickly map home directories and user profiles, and we can also do some group management. So I can, very, you know, if a user puts in a ticket that they don't have permissions to something or need access to something, I can very quickly come in here, search for a group, uh, add, them to a, add them to a new group, remove groups, import and export as well. And uh, this show effective memberships, by the way, will show you the recursion on all your groups. So if you want to see how that group inheritance is working, you can get a very quick look on that. Uh, login history here is going to show us this user's login history. This is not a Windows log. This is a Goverland log. And we're using it to populate this next feature, which is logged in workstation detection. This is kind of a key element in Goverland in that we can map you right to your user's active sessions. You don't have to uh, you know, have those conversations of what machine are you currently using, where are you currently logged in, what's your computer name, what's your IP address. You click on this, it's going to map you right to their active sessions. And you can see Aaron Woods has a couple of active sessions going on, including a Citrix Zen app session. And in this case, uh, in Citrix, 
uh, in Citrix or RDP, it's going to map you right to that hosting server. And this really helps you uh, support your virtual users, your users who are, in, uh, who are on Zen Apps, Zen Desktop, or RDP, because you're, you're not going to have to go through jumping through any hoops to figure out which server that session ended up on. It's going to map you right to the hosting server and then give you some really awesome tools to uh, support those, um, those RDP and Zen, Zen Apps, Zen Desktop users. We'll take a look at that as well. From here, I can expose our admin and diagnostics tool set. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this because I think for the most part we're familiar. It's all native Windows tools. Difference being is that it's behind the scenes and it's permissioned as you, the administrator, sitting behind the console. And that's important for you folks who are new to Goverland. Goverland is an impersonation engine. Right? So it's always going to impersonate the role of the person sitting behind the console. Wherever you have permissions within your Windows environment, those are the type of actions you'll be able to do. That's the, those are, you know, that's what you'll be able to do. And, and likewise, if you don't have permissions, you won't be able to perform those actions. There is a credentialing manager built in. This is a great tool for storing uh, alternate credentials. Let's say you have some service accounts for computers or servers, IP ranges or domains. You can pop them in here. And as you move through the environment, there's a hierarchy. It's going to first look at the credentialing manager, then look at your role in Windows, and then finally prompt you for, uh, for proper authorization. <clears throat> so there is a question about a bit of setup required to show a user's computer sessions. And there is a bit of setup to do um, if you, if, uh, I, I know uh, Victor will be able to drop you into a quick KB article on what's required, or maybe he wants to address it now. Victor, you want to uh, talk about that quickly? Uh, yeah, I just went ahead and responded with a link uh, directly to um, our Getting Started Guide section um, that talks about the Governance Central Data Repository. And basically, the prerequisite is a very simple network share that everybody has access to. Um, and once you set that up, um, it basically needs to be set on both the console machine so that the Goverland um, suite knows where to, to check on the, on the user login session and on the client side. And that can be set either via registry, via GPO, via our um, GPO templates that automatically get included with the installation of Goverland or the central server. Okay. And uh, for those of you with this with a similar question or needing assistance, we'll reach out right after this demo and, and help you get that resolved. Uh, so there is a tiny bit of configuration is the answer. Um, there's some good documentation and, um, and 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 we'll be able to assist with that. Um, so again, not going to go through all these tools, but do want to show you something in system information here, and that's just the level of detail we're be, we're able to gather on these on these machines. And this is all via the uh, Goverland agent. And just to give you an idea of how detailed we can get, I mean, if you click through here, if you can think of it, we can uh, report on it, build reports on it across our entire environment, and uh, even alert on it as well. So you can see uh, just. Tons and tons of information. I can see local drive space, memory information. I can even modify network settings, rename a computer, join or unjoin a domain. And then uh, down here, I can see this, the login event for this machine. So this is the other half of the log file we were looking at a moment ago. So this is a log file of who uses this machine, who logs in and out of Longhorn 3. And then also audits on remote control sessions. And this is a very important report for those of you with any type of compliance concerns, because if you have techs logging in and out of remote machines, you want to be able to uh, provide this to the auditors, which tech logged in, how long they were logged in for, who the console user was. Uh, all that information is really important. <clears throat> And now, when I remove an agent off of this machine, um, again, this experience of removing the agent is totally invisible to the end user, and their machine is totally functional. It doesn't restart it. But on my side, I, as me, the administrator, as you can see that I switch to historical data. And this is this concept of shore data that Goverland provides, which is online machines, you're seeing real-time information. It's, it's what the machine looks like right now. Offline machines, you're seeing the last time it got pulled by the database. And this is giving this really true view of your environment. 
where you know online machines real time, offline machines last available. So you have this the best of both worlds between reliability and availability. And again, bringing this machine back under management and seeing real time information is that easy. I'm just going to install the agent; it's going to pop it back on there, and now I'm seeing real time info again. So I want to take it a step further with software products because there, again, like I mentioned, there were a lot of questions related to software deployment recently. And here I'm deploying, I'm managing software on one machine. And again, native Windows, not a whole lot of learning curve. I'm going to remove Adobe Reader off of this machine. And just to show you that, you know, you, you, can, uninstall an, you can uninstall an application remotely without ever starting a remote control session. It's not going to interrupt the user unless obviously they were using Adobe Reader at the time. And Adobe Reader is now gone. Now, getting Adobe Reader back on, I, I set up the package with you before. You saw me uh, build it all out. You saw how simple it was. You know, most difficult part was pointing us to where that that uh, that, pet, that that executable is located on a file share somewhere, and maybe uh, researching those argument strings. Uh, hitting yes again, it's going to transfer that package to the client and then run us through that uh, uh, install, and the whole time without interrupting that end user. And that's why we really, you, you know, you have to supply the argument strings on the EXEs. The MSI files, they'll always be deployed silently, um, so you don't have to provide us any argument strings. And uh, we'll just give this a couple of seconds, and it's actually going to go and deploy Adobe Reader and make it available for immediate use for this user. So it finished deploying, and we can see that it's now deployed. Really, that that straightforward. So again, the, the, there's really no complexity in so in the software deployment world. And by the way, you can build out those packages kind of at uh, on the fly as well. You can just come in here to manage. It opens the same manager, and uh, here are all your packages there. So uh, you know, when, when you're setting up deployments, the best thing to do is to build out the package and then just test it on the machine or two, make sure it works. You can even launch a remote control session and make sure it uh, it uh, it gets on there the the right way. So um, uh, we have a question here about getting a report on software installed on a group of machines instead of one by one, and that's actually uh, a great segue because that's the next thing we're going to talk about here. So uh, what I'm first doing is I'm right clicking on this machine and setting focus on it down at the bottom so that I'm looking at an OU of workstations. And these are live views, by the way. Documents are indicating the machine state and operating system, and blue text is all dynamic, black, te black text is all static. Now, at the beginning of the demo, we were taking a look at custom actions. Custom actions is how you build these reports, right? Um, so we're going to go and build out the, uh, the report that was asking for, show me all of the software deployed on the machine. So I'm going to create a new custom action for a computer view, and I'm going to call it software inventory uh, report, if I can type today, report uh, for demo. And uh, you can give it a description. You can also uh, put it in a category. It's just that little foldering so that you can easily find stuff. Now, to get a report on software deployed on a, on a machine, I'm going to hit this Add Remove button here, Report on Computer Property, and then there's menus on menus of information here. I'm just going to move down to Software Products, and anything I check off in here is going to become a column header. So I'm going to check off product name, product version, product code, and maybe the install date. All right. Now, on top of this, I may want to know, you know which users use this machine so that I know, like, uh, maybe I'm doing a report, and I want to make sure that I'm not, um, I'm not, uh, you know, messing up some information for some users, and maybe I also want to see some computer identity information, maybe some OS info. So I can combine a whole bunch of different information in one one report, and when I hit OK, hit OK again, it builds out the report for me, and it's now available. So now, if I want to run that report against one machine. I can just select it, and it's actually going to run in real time. It's going to actually go and, and, and hit that node right now, produce that report for me. Just opened up in my other tab here, so I'll drag it over. And we'll see that all the OS info, the uh, software deployed, and the user login, login events. And I can actually edit this report and produce an, uh, an Excel version as well. <clears throat> Now, running this same report on multiple machines at once is uh, is very very simple and straightforward, um, and that and that's what we'll use Governland Scope for. 
Just give me one second to get that going here. <clears throat> Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to build that same report, but now instead of using uh, one machine, we're going to target a whole OU of workstations, right? So here, again, software inventory report. Uh, all you do is give it a name. You can give it a description. And again, we have these categories or folders. So if I want to put that in my software inventory folder, I can. And then I'm going to hit next. Now, in here, you can target users, computers, or groups. In this case, I'm going to target computers because I want to pull a report on software deployed. And I'm going to add a container or domain. And I'm just going to browse through uh, Active Directory here and jump into some production workstations and uh, just add those as, as my target for what I'm going to report on. Now, hitting Next uh, will allow me to create the same action. Now, this is the same exact wizard we were just looking at. So I, I just go to Report Computer Property. Go down to software products, check off the things that I want to see. Okay? And uh, we saw that. We saw the login history. And then uh, we also pulled in some OS info. So I'm just going to check off that same information again and then hit OK. Now, all I do here is hit next. And then I can define a report format. So we'll take a look at this data sheet format now. And you can decide whether you want to run this now or run it later. I'm just going to run it right now. So I'm going to hit Finish. And we'll try and hit Show Details here before it finishes. But it looks like I'm too late. Um, and it's actually building out this report for me. And here is the report. So this data sheet format, you click into each machine, and it's going to show you all of the information we asked for against each machine. So up top, we'll see the OS info. I see that this is, you know, uh, it's version 5.1. Uh, I know it's, it's Windows XP Professional. I can see all the software deployed and all the user login events. And then again, I can browse through all the other machines that I included in, in that report and, uh, and um, see that same level of information. <clears throat> and Scope Actions is a separate module from Goverland Administration and Diagnostics, but I do want to show you one quick trick. So like if you're looking at one OU of workstations, you can do like a shift, you know, a control click and grab a couple of machines. Obviously, it's not the most efficient way, but if all you have is administration and diagnostics, if let's say I just want to see, I have an Adobe Reader report here. I just want to see what version of Adobe Reader is installed on these machines. I can uh, do like a shift click open it up, and then very quickly see that these three machines have Adobe Reader version 11 installed on them. So uh, if you, you know, I saw another question in there of if, uh, you know, if all you had is administration and diagnostics, you can produce these same reports as long as the machines are in the same OU. So there's a, another question about saving actions. So yes, these reports, these actions and reports can be saved. They're separate in custom actions and scope actions, um, but you can save the ones in scope actions as well. You save them as templates and they're shareable among team members. So if I want to create, if I want to save that report as a template, I just go to add to action templates. And then once it's in an action template, I can decide to share it among team members. And this is a good time to mention the difference between uh, share with team, make available to team, and enforce on my team. So, you know, share with team creates a, a read-write version. Enforce with team creates a read-only version. Victor, am I right on all that? Yes, that's correct. And what is make available? Then? So I forgot that one. Um, okay, so basically, I'm going to take control here if I can. Sure. Uh, request control. Well, let me hit it. Okay, so... Um, that's fine. So um, essentially, whenever you want to go ahead and say, for example, this Java one here, um, and I want to share it with my team. When you make available to the team, basically what it does is it allows you to go ahead and um, make it available for people to access here in this area here. One second here. Uh, in the view available objects for my team. So in here is where it will go, and you can see that Raul went ahead and shared a package um, earlier last year with um, um, with the entire team. So instead of it being enforced upon or automatically made available into well, your automatically added. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, it'll it'll automatically add it to the published uh, published object section. It's kind of like you know a central area where they can go in and uh, import their own the the ones that they want to use as opposed to you know whatever the team wants them for. Something. Awesome. So. Okay. And so uh, you know, in custom actions in admin and diagnostics, those can easily be shared. And obviously, in scope actions, you first uh, add it to your action templates, and then you can make it available, share it, or enforce it. <clears throat> So now there are obviously a ton of different things we can do with both custom actions and scope actions. So I want to try and take you through some examples that may show you how you can automate some of the more cumbersome tasks that you're faced with. And I'm just going to jump back into administration and diagnostics for just a moment here, because active directory provisioning uh, seems to be an area that people have quite a bit of interest in. There's, there's a lot of cumbersome work in the active directory world. And, um, and, and so we, we have some really cool use cases. And uh, I'm going to test this on this user, Amy McKenna, here. And so what I have here is, uh, is some user management actions. And the first one is to terminate a user. And I really like showing this because this is a point in time where I, IT has to interact with HR. And, um, and these interactions always happen 4.30 on a Friday where you have plans that night. And it's the most inconvenient time. And you're staying late. And uh, you know your your uh, your significant other is getting annoyed. So um, if you can formalize a process like this, build it out in the wizard, and have it available to you with a single click, it obviously has a huge benefit. And so and so that's what I've done here. Uh, you'll see for this terminate employee action, we'll run a group membership report. We'll log off the user sessions in real time. And if I click into this, you can see that in my log off action, I can actually display a warning to the user. I mean, I'm just kidding around here, but it says you're being terminated, report to HR immediately and bring your stuff. And then run a user login history report, do some active directory cleanup and remove group memberships. And this is great because um, you know, if you know, a lot of times we forget a step or two, or maybe your process looks different, and there's some other things you want to do as well. I know I was talking to a school recently that wanted to clean up all of the user profiles on on machines when users got terminated, and that's a great use case as well. Something to add in there. And so when I run this now, it's actually again going to run in real time and run through each one of those steps that, that I laid out. You can see that it performed all those actions successfully. It opens up my reports for me. Here I see uh, the two groups this user was a member of and all of that user's login history. And if I refresh my screen here, I can see that user is now gone. And uh, one of my actions was to move that user to, to a term the user, and that's where the user is now. Um, <clears throat> now, when I when I double click on this user and I look at their account, I can see that the user's account is disabled. Their password has been changed, and all of their groups have been all of their permissions have been removed. Now, as easily as I as I terminated this user, I can also provision a user. And I mentioned earlier, you can build all different provisioning templates. So so. Um, and uh, I see somebody's asking if if I can disable the account as part of the terminate action, and that's indeed what I did. You can see that the account is disabled. Okay, um, and and I'll show you that step in the wizard in just a second. Now, as easily as I terminated that user, I can I can provision a user here. I'm going to provision this user for IT, and it's going to unroll the exact process I just did. Now, if I refresh here again. The user is going to be gone, and if I move into my uh, into my IT users, um, that user Amy McKenna should be appear in this list, and their account should be re-enabled. So uh, you can see that as easily as we disable the account, we re-enabled it. And I'll walk you through each one of those steps, just so you can see uh, exactly what we did here. So the group membership report is just uh, a report on all of this user's groups, just to give me an idea what, where this user had permissions. Maybe there's things I want to update. Uh, log off all their current sessions. We looked at before, it just logged them off, and it displayed that message for them. The login history report is just going to show me uh, where this user, all their login history events. Uh, the active directory cleanup. Here I'm going to set the account to disabled, uh, set the password to expired, and then move the object. And all you're doing for these is coming into set user property, user account information, checking off account, uh, checking off password expired. And then you want to execute a user action to move the object, and then you define where you want the object to be moved to. Okay. 
<clears throat> and so again, this is really going to help us with, you know, really kind of taking these complex processes that we have to deal with. And the user management is a great example because it's, it's always a sequence of events and uh, formalize them, automate them, and be done with them. Let's jump into a couple of other uh, examples that we can build out of things that we can uh, monitor and alert on. And, and the monitoring and alerting is really fantastic in government. And, and uh, you know, we're, I've been talking to a lot of folks lately who have uh, inherited or, or uh, poorly maintained Active Directory environments. Let's say they have tons of inactive accounts in there and inactive machines, and they need a way to seek and clean out all of these inactive users or, or inactive objects. And so here what I did is I just built out a scope action, and I define a, a scope or a target of users in this case. And then in my action module, all this is is a report. So to, for me to build an alert, all it is is a report with what I want to get alerted on. In this case, it's an account statistic and their last logon stamp. And then I apply some conditions for where that user has not logged on within the last 90 days. Those are the conditions I want met. And um, we have this little um, dynamic definitions that you can set up here. And I'll just show you how to uh, build this out. Again, here I'm looking at current date and time minus uh, you know, one day times 90. So, uh, you know, a user that has not logged in in the, in the past 90 days. And this takes a little bit of getting used to, but you can insert all kinds of dynamic variables. You use your insert key, and I can, I can even move, put in like current date, less 90 days, or however I decide to build out the formula. Obviously, there are a bunch of different ways. And then once I've defined uh, my time period that I want to alert on, I can add in whatever other actions I want. So maybe, maybe in my moving day, my moving 90-day window, I want to automatically move them to the inactive users OU, or I want to, or I want to just produce a report, or whatever else I want to do, I can add that in as as other actions. And then all I have to do is run this on a schedule. So I'm going to define a schedule and I'm going to say, hey, every single day. Go out and check every single day at 9 a.m. Go out and check for any inactive users. And so if there was an inactive user on, that has only been inactive for 89 days, he wouldn't get returned in that, was, in that report and, and nothing would happen. But on that 90th day, it would trigger, hey, this user has been inactive for 90 days, so I'm going to perform any of the follow-up tasks you set up. And just like I'm targeting users, I can target machines as well. So I can do things like build a hard disk monitor. Hard disk monitor is really easy to build. You target machines, you define some actions, right? In this case, I'm going to bring in device name, available spaces of percent, and available physical memory. And I'm going to, I'm going to supply some conditions. Where the C drive, in this case, I did less than 90% because somebody wanted to see the report. But you can do less than 10%. Have this run every 10 minutes or however often you want. And on top of it, just returning results of machines that are about to run out of hard disk space, you can perform some file and directory actions or deploy a script or do something else that's going to make sure you don't end up in trouble. And the same thing we can monitor for you know, machines that don't return a ping or monitor for running processes or running applications and send wake on LAN packets through or restart processes or anything like that. So a lot of flexibility here. Now the only thing is, is that Goverland Scope Actions is a framework. So we're not going to define any of this stuff. What we have is a tutorial section on our site. You can find that at govrland.com slash support. Um, so visit our site. Everything I showed you so far is in that tutorial section. So you can build out a hard disk monitor. You can build out those terminated users. You can build out um, uh, you know, uh, monitor for uh, things that don't return pings or anything like that. <clears throat> Just seeing if there's anything else I want to show you in uh, Coverland scope actions here before we uh, I think I think uh, we painted a good picture for today's demo. Um, you know, I think it's you know when when you're doing deployments, they become really easy now. Again, within scope actions, uh, if you're doing a deployment against a group of machines, it uses those same deployment packages we were looking at in admin and diagnostics. The only difference is you're defining that added layer of the scope of machines instead of deploying against one machine. You're deploying against a group of machines. All you do is come in here to execute computer actions. 
and you'll see it opens up that same wizard. So we can just grab the same Adobe Reader and now deploy it against a whole OU of workstations. Victor, you want to address that uh, question from Tom? Yeah, I wanted to address Tom's question and as well as M. Todd Hess's question that he sent directly okay. um, to me. So um, the, the first one I wanted to answer was M. Todd Hess's question. I'm not sure if anybody else can see it because it was a private message, but he's asking if he can exclude certain machines at the scope level. Now, this all pretty much depends on how you like to select your scope. Of course, you can exclude certain machines at the um, scope level by adding them individually, adding them by a specific input file. If you save them into a text or .csv for specific machines that you like to manage, an IP range, a site, or even a container. Um, and you can also, depending on the name, for example, you can also add a name uh, filter. So in this case, say we go into our production workstations, and um, we have some machines in there by the name of Longhorn. We have Longhorn 2 and Longhorn 3. So I can basically put long and it'll only include any workstation name that includes the word long inside of it. So that's a, a way to filter. Now you can also filter at the action module level, meaning if you like to just go ahead and select your entire domain, include all of your subcontainers, and go into your action module, you can um, create a condition that excludes specific machines. Now, um, my colleague Raul suggested that we have some clients that like to add a specific registry key to certain machines, for example, IT machines, if they don't have a specific naming convention or if they're all in an OU, where you can set a condition where a, a registry key is equal to a specific key that you save, or you can even say where a um, where an IP address is equal to a specific IP. So it'll run the action on only machines that have a specific IP, subnet, um, or even OS, for example. We have um, clients that like to select the entire, um, your entire Active Directory domain and then select only OS version is equal to, for example, oh, sorry, I'm at the IP area, OS version not equal to Windows Server, for example. So if you want to exclude all of your, for example, if you want to exclude all of your servers. So that's one way that you can um, exclude uh, machines, whether it be at the condition level, uh, sorry, at the action level or the scope level. Um, the other question I wanted to answer was for Tom Howe. He wanted to know if you needed to use a central server to share with your team or can you use a shared direct a network or directory. So. Um, the central server is only for policy distribution to your clients and your consoles and for auditing. It does not, um, it does not deal with any type of sharing. It will allow you to set the shared data database, which is where all of your um, packages are shared. So that is the centralized location. It's your shared data database, um, which is right here. Real quick. Um, settings, database settings. As long as all your texts are pointed to this database, then this is where um, this is where you can go ahead and share um, all of your packages with your team. And so there's two other there's two other questions that came in here. Yeah. So uh, Michael's asking on uh, on the user provisioning part. Um, what about object creation? And and so I know in the object creation world, the only thing we don't do is bulk object creation. But in terms of adding in all of the user's information. Uh, Victor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you have complete access to the ADSI, so you can build out a template and just use our wizard to kind of populate all the information. Is that right? Yeah, so basically when it comes to creating users, you could only do it at a one-to-one -one basis where you would have to come into administration and diagnostics, select the OU where you want, and go ahead and hit add new. This will automatically pop up either the built-in um, um, RSAT tools that you have installed on the machine or a GUI that simulates the same options, that you, the basic options that you can create a user with in Active Directory. Once you go ahead and create that one user, then you can create specific custom actions and templates um, for different IT, uh, for different departments. For example, you can have, you know, uh, um, your IT department and you can automatically set the address, the location, the reporting manager and all that. So you can create templates for um, your users after you go ahead and uh, create them. 
I'm going to grab control back here if I can. And uh, you, you'll see like if you go into that provisioning here, you'll see that um, if you hit the add remove and you want to set property, you can open up the entire ad C, bring in whatever other attributes you want to set, and then they'll be available for you uh, to manage from within the uh, template. Uh, you want to address the um, the uh, version on Goverland? I'm not sure which version you're using, but normally the upload process is pretty painless. Victor, any concerns there? Yes, um, it's fairly painless. When it comes to the licensing, you shouldn't have any issues. Um, as long as there weren't any uh, major changes to the, the hardware of the machine. Um, but in terms of the licensing, um, once you go ahead and execute the EXC on the same machine, it just goes ahead and upgrades um, whatever install you have of Goverland on your machine. So be sure to, to try to check for updates. Um, every, every month to three months, we try to release a minor update um, for Goverland uh, addressing either any improvements or, or minor bug fixes that we have. So And just to show you uh, what version we're currently on, and it, this is kind of important because this version is, is uh, you know, for all of our customers out there, this is a, you know, we have uh, done some really nice enhancements in this latest release. So just make sure you're on 801.10. Um, that's our current version. It's got you know, very stable, We've got some really nice features. Um, if you're using Goverland on a Microsoft Surface, we've added in a whole bunch of uh, touch gestures, things like that. Um, there was a new agent released with this version as well. So um, uh, everybody should check for updates. Make sure you're updated on the latest version. <clears throat> um, yeah, and we can take a look at some conditional filters here as well. Um, I see that there's a question coming in about that. Um, so I, I'm going to make it try and make it simple. And uh, this actually this um, this uh, Adobe Reader, uh, sorry, Adobe Reader report really should explain it. So it's only going to, it's only going to uh, display results where that condition is equal to true or perform an action where that equal, where that condition is equal to true. Right? So uh, what does that mean? So if we look at that Adobe Reader report I, I showed you earlier, um, it's a very simple report. It's going to show us product name, product version, and install date. But I only want to see where the product name contains Adobe Reader. Now if I remove this condition, it's going to show me all the software deployed, right? So if we and you can also, if you like, um, you can also include on top of adding where software name is equal to Adobe Reader. You can add a second condition where you can put where software version is equal to version, absolutely, uh, or you can even put less than, uh, you know, version eleven. So the here whole you, thing can you want. Sorry, okay, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. No, so you can see I removed that condition and I see all the software deployed, including Adobe Reader. But when I add that condition back in, uh, product name contains Adobe Reader, it's just going to isolate in just on, um, just on that, that solution, that piece of software. Um, so now uh, you, you can have, the, it, it depends on what you're evaluating, obviously, what what it's going to return. So here I'm evaluating software deployed, so it's only going to return um, um, uh, instances where it's equal to um, uh, Adobe Reader. And is the condition and or or? I believe it's, uh, I'm going to You can select that. Um, I'm going to show you here. OK. Uh, which one was it that you're using, provisioning? Which one is it? Go to the report? I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, which you're, you need to be on the machine. Okay, here we go. You were doing a Adobe report. All right, so. All right, so automatically when you add two actions, so set computer conditions, software products, product name. Also, um, just a little side note, just a little quick tip. Um, make sure that if you're going to use the equal to, you put it exactly as Goverland shows it because Goverland is very, very specific. Um, I like to use begins with um, because it's always great um, for, for doing quick reports, for example, like Adobe Reader. Um, because we have some, there's some software vendors out there like Intel that likes to insert like a copyright symbol. So it might not work out if you do the equal. Um, so once you go ahead and you add another one. Version is equal to 
just say another one. Here you have the set scope button. So it'll say all, which is basically it needs to meet every single condition or only one or more of the instances of the program must pass the condition for the computer object to yeah. be selected and accepted. So the default selection is uh, or, um, but you can go ahead and switch it to and if you like here. That's awesome. And by the way, if, if when you are building these reports, like if you're trying to figure out exactly the fields, like uh, you know Victor mentioned, he does to begin with, it's really really easy to just you know create a general report once and just run it, just so you can see the value that you need to pass through. So like if I just run this report, I can quickly see that for Adobe Reader, if I want to make sure that I have the product name exactly right, just run the report, you know, just copy it. And paste it in, and then you'll you'll know that you got the uh, product name right. So uh, it makes it very easy to manage that way. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things where we're kind of low on time here. So I want to take you through a couple of uh, more the more advanced features in Goverland Remote Control. Um, and so one of them is is um, how we handle um, uh, RDP and Citrix Zen App and Zen and Zen Desktop sessions. So here I'm focused on our test user, Aaron Woods, and you can see that he has a Citrix session going on. So when I right click on this and I set focus on that machine, it's going to navigate over to the OU that contains that Citrix, his hosting server. Now from here I can detect all of the logged in users, and if there were multiple sessions going on on this hosting server, whether it's an RDP server or just a Citrix Citrix server, it'll show you all of the user sessions. And this really helps, especially in the Citrix world, where you don't have to dig through the session broker to figure out where that user session ended up. Now from here, I can right click on this user. And this log off and reset button are so, so great, because uh, people don't know how to exit these RDP and Citrix sessions properly, and they orphan them. They X out of them, and then they can't log back in, and they, you know, they can't figure out why they can't log back in. And they put in support tickets, and these tickets you know, end up at the, you know, the support team, and they have to get routed over the Citrix team or something like that. And I talk to a lot of customers who have you know, that type of thing going on. So being able to give your level one, level two people access to support these Citrix or RDP sessions very easily is obviously important. So search for a user, match you right to the hosting server, uh, focus in on that user, and then I can log off or reset the session without ever jumping onto the server, without ever jumping through hoops. I can also start a remote control session against the user's machine, or actually use Goverland's proprietary way of shadowing Citrix user sessions. And that's what I opened up right here. So this is a Zen app session. It's actually just our, our Goverland uh, data sheet here, our, our product brief. And you can see that I can't actually see the user's desktop. All I can see is um, the published Zen app session. Now, if I actually connect to the user's desktop, which is that Longhorn 3 machine, by the way, you can see that this is totally Active Directory integrated. So all I need to know is a partial machine name. I hit connect. Now I can see the entire user's desktop, including that published app. Okay. Now, from here, I can also click right up here, uh, and that's going to take me into this console view where I can see the actual server and all of the other user sessions. If there were multiple user sessions, I can see them all laid out in front of me right here. Uh, Victor, you want to take control? I'm not sure. Is this what you wanted me to show? Or? Yeah, yeah. Do we have any other sessions on VDA2 open as well, or is this the only one? I only opened one, but uh, you, you know, if there if there are multiple open, as many as you have on each server, they'll all just appear over here. Victor, if you want to launch another one, I'll we'll we'll refresh here in just a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm launching one. I just want to mention, once you're in a remote control session on a machine, we're sitting at a lower layer than UAC. So this comes up a lot with, uh, especially with new customers. Are you going to be able to interact with UAC prompts? And if I right click and do a run as, you can see. UAC prompt pops up, and I'm able to click on it and interact with it without an issue. Um, um, the other thing is, I can actually re uh, I can I can log off this user, log in as a different user, do all different kinds of things, all while maintaining that remote control session. Um, you're not going to have to, uh, you know, you're not going to have to um, do anything. You just we're sitting at a lower layer than that user session. Essentially, is uh, kind of the non-technical term for it. Uh, there's some connection. If you want to go back to um, 
I apologize. If you want to go back to video one I, real quick, I went ahead and. Uh, okay. So, so as now you can, you can see that there's two I, users. I, yeah, ahead. I apologize. As you saw, he had it open already in the in the tab, and it automatically refreshed whatever session was open on the actual server. He didn't need to disconnect from our VDA server and reconnect to it. Goverland went ahead and automatically updated um, whatever active session is on the machine, and then you can go ahead and hit open all if you like. And um, it'll go ahead and open all the sessions and on RC into all of them. Awesome. And so, yeah, if you hit this open all, like you said, it's just going to connect to all of those sessions at once. So. Um, some other things we can take a look at here are these favorites. I love these favorites because this gives you quick access to those machines that that you, you need quick access. So um, you could set up containers of favorites, and this is also a great way if you're if you're not an Active Directory shop, you just have a bunch of workgroup machines, or if you have you know non-domain join machines, you can manage non-domain join machines with Coverland. Um, you just need to be a local admin, um, but it, you know you can store them in favorites, and then uh, you can see I can add a static container, an Active Directory container, or an IP subnet, and then uh, just open up a, a folder here, and all my favorite machines will appear. I double click on any machine, it's just going to start a remote control session. Um, now the cool part is I can open up multiple remote control sessions at once, right? And this is great, um, you know, uh, coming through lately on, you know, I have a whole bunch of lab machines and I want to qu have quick access to them and, you know, I'm connecting to them individually. Build out a favorite folder, right click on it, open up sessions at once, do the default action, and it's going to open up all of those remote control sessions in this tiled view. Now if I double click on any machine, it's going to take me into a one-on-one -on -one session with that machine. Okay, And they're all just tabbed across the top here. I can jump back into my monitoring view really easily. Um, once I set up a view the way you like it, the way I like it, by the way, I can add and remove heat map performance counters that live underneath each machine here. So I can set up a view with the information I want to see. I can click this Save Layout button. It's going to save it as an icon on my desktop or somewhere else. And then this is going to give me really quick access to a group of machines that I need quick access to. It's just an icon. You double click on that icon, it'll reestablish remote control sessions with all these machines and drop you into this monitoring view. And uh, as I move across the top here, I know I have uh, some machines with multiple monitors. I know I get asked that quite a bit. You can see I can span across them. I can move between them. So we offer a lot of control. I think I have to log into this machine first here. Um, they had a new one. Here. Um, We'll just let this log in, and I'll show you how we handle uh, multiple monitors. Some other tools, by the way, that are available to use chat and send messages. You can communicate with your end users. By the way, multiple support technicians can be logged into one remote control session at once. So you can collaborate on an issue, pass controls back and forth, do things like that. Um, you can open up the task, task manager. This is the same task manager that's available in Government Administration and Diagnostics, and it's a super task manager. So you'll see things like process parent relationships, the top five talkers in real time, and uh, hover states on all these performance charts. Now somebody's asking about the uh, turning on and off the remote, remote control session pop-up. Yes, you have complete control over that. That's what the Government Central Server is for. You can also use a GPO template that we provide. Now, now your, your options include having one that stays up for 10 seconds, having one that, dis that doesn't display at all. We actually don't even need to run in the tray, and we can record remote control sessions. So for those of you out there looking for like a stealth monitoring solution, that's included. And actually, if I, uh, if I jump back into my monitoring view here, if I'm watching a group of machines, I can right click on a machine and start a recording that quickly. Um, now, uh, you can also have one that requires an end user accept a remote control session. And that, uh, again, is great if you, wanna, if you want to make sure your C levels, you don't just drop in on a remote control session. And by the way, if you're doing that silent stealth mode, um, where you're not notifying the users, you can also enter in, and uh, it also enters you in an observe only mode so that you don't uh, move around their mouse and keyboard and give away uh, what's going on. And all that's in these connection settings. You can enter in observe only or in an admin mode, which will, uh, which will blank out the screen for the end user while you perform an admin task. 
and disable client controls, which will turn off the mouse and keyboard for an end user that keeps on moving that mouse and keyboard around on you while you're trying to help them. So uh, a file manager here will let you move around files and folders. And then the command prompt is the same command prompt, all the same tools as in Goverland administration and diagnostics. This is a great command prompt, by the way, because again, it's permissioned as me, the admin. I can organize my favorite commands and send them over with a single click. So if I want to do an IP config, I can do that. And it's also PowerShell enabled. So um, you know, if you type in PowerShell, I don't know why that went haywire, Victor. You're going to have to look at that. I think I have a stuck key. Um, so uh, the drag and drop drop zones here. This is secure file transfer. You can grab local files, transfer them to the remote machine. It's just drag and drop. You can set up your drop zones. I can grab something off my desktop. And it's using our, our communication, our agent communication to transfer files. And there's also a clipboard transfer here as well. If you're copying something off your local clipboard, you click here and it'll, it'll move into your remote clipboard. Uh, optimization tools, I get, we, we expose all the optimization. You can do things like reduce down to grayscale, reduce refresh rates, anything you need uh, to get more out of the product. And you know, if you're in a light bandwidth scenario, a lot of customers who use Goverland to, uh, to support you know, remote POS machines or uh, POS systems or uh, POS machines, I guess, um, or, or ATMs or, or slot machines, things like that. Again, everything's encrypted in both directions. Absolutely nothing sent in plain text. Um, another question here, the, the session has been recorded. It will be available for later viewing. And if you need, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us. You can contact me directly. I'm, I'm available through our sales channel. If you just email sales at govrland.com, you, you can put it attention, Ezra. Any questions you have, or if you want subsequent training, we're definitely available for that. Um, and uh, Tyler is, has a question here about uh, in V7, the remote control session ran as the logged in user. This was helpful. As a V8, this runs as the Goverland admin account. Can you address that, Victor? I'm not sure. Uh, one moment, let me confirm. I mean, in this case, I'm definitely the logged in user here, right? Because <laughs> logged in is. Uh, Craig Taylor, not as myself. So I'm not sure what's going on there. No, the def you would have to specify it. The, the default is by the by the administrator because the reason why is so that you can be able to access UAC and be able to perform management tasks on the um, on the actual client machine. It's definitely not. Um, it's definitely not a preference to be to to initiate a remote control session with the permissions as the logged in user. And uh, just to uh, you know take that a step further and show them how they can actually do that. If I uh, create a new tab here, um, when I hit connect, under this options, if you hit this options um, and authentication, you can supply alternate credentials. Is that how I would get that done? Just making sure. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, obviously the same for the uh, remote console. You know, if you were, you know, you can open up that remote console in just a session. So I can switch to uh, the command prompt and then just supply those alternate credentials. You want to uh, address Jer Jeremy's question? That one is a little bit over my head. Yeah, I'm, re I'm reading it now. OK. And we are winding down here. It's, it's been a great hour. This was recorded. I will, hopefully, if the recording came out, last time I attempted, I captured all of three seconds. But if the recording came out, I'll make it available to everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I hope you found this helpful. I am going to try and reach out to you for some feedback, ask you about 
what other sessions you'd like to know about. I mean, there's so much depth in Goverland. We could spend an hour just talking about Active Directory management or, or some automation or, or even just on NTFS permissions and group memberships because that's a huge area of concern for some of our customers. There's great ways to automate all that type of stuff. So uh, I'll give it back to Victor here. And uh, any other questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A or the chat. We'll definitely address them. If we can't address them live, we'll uh, follow up with you offline. So go ahead, Victor. Okay, so when it comes to the database, um, can you open up um, the seat for me real quick? Well, I, you, you want to, what do you want me to open up? I'm sorry. Open up the suite, the Goverland suite, please. Sure. You can uh, minimize this if you like. And just read his question if, if you want. I, I will uh, read it. It says, I uh, often has to reimage 50 plus machines when they are rebuilt. They keep the same computer name as they had before. Is there an easy way to purge the old machines out of the database and kill the historical data? Okay, so um, in terms of the, pur in order to purge any type of data inside of the database, you would simply go to settings, database settings, advanced settings, and you would go ahead and purge any data that you have. Um, currently, there's no method to be able to go into the database and purge specific data um, per machines. But I can tell you that once you go ahead and um, connect to the machine uh, successfully after it's been re-imaged and re-added to the network, once you access it once, it'll go ahead and update that data um, with the new information. And you can create a scope action to bring all that information back in. So if you had to purge against your entire environment, you can get that information back in. And uh, Vincent, is yeah, we have, we have clients who like to um, create a scope action, and they'll basically create a report and select only specific things that they want um, from here. For example, they don't really care about the serial number um, or who it's registered to, but some people do care about the last IE version that it had, what product key it had installed, um, what type of RAM it had installed. So you can go ahead and specifically report on that and set a schedule for it. So you can report on that every, um, every day or every week. And any, any data that's reported on via scope actions automatically gets populated into the shared data database. So that um, is also a great way to keep that shared data database uh, fresh if you like to have uh, fresh information at your yeah, and that's, um, that's a great yeah. point, is that uh, any information you want to make sure is stored in shore data, you can just run a recurring port, report on it, you know, maybe once a day, maybe once a week, and you'll make sure that all of those machines got checked into the database as often as you like. And just another question about recording a screen using remote control. Could you record a machine in stealth and watch them at another time? Absolutely, that's exactly what it's for. Um, yeah. And basically, when you go ahead and you record um, a session, oh, you already had it open, but once you go ahead and record a session and you're done, um, when you go ahead and you press record, it's going to ask you where you want to save it. So you save it to wherever, you know, location where you want, and then you just view it um, after you're done. And we can show you that real quick here. You can open up the yeah. video settings as well, and uh, when I hit record here, it's going to ask me where I want to save that recording. <clears throat> so again, thanks to everyone for joining us today. I hope you found this informative. Uh, looks like one more, uh, oh, just a comment here. I uh, hope you found this informative. Hope this was helpful. We're going to be doing a lot more of these. Uh, we hope to connect with all of you uh, a lot more often. And uh, any, any feedback you want to share, any other things you want to see, feel free to reach out to us. You can reach Victor and his team at govrland.com slash support. There's a contact us. There's live chat. You can uh, reach out to us either way. Um, and you can reach me at sales at govrland.com. Uh, just put attention, Ezra. I will personally address it. And uh, thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you have a great weekend.